Welcome, Pastor Nash. Good to see, yeah, good to see you. Uh, where might you be this day? I'm actually in my car in New Jersey right now. I'm uh, camping with my parents at the beach. And, it's amazing, uh, so you can yeah. see my surroundings are a little bit different than they typically yeah. are. Yeah, it's amazing what you can do with technology today. I want to welcome our group. Thank you for joining us uh, for Ask Pastor Mark with uh, Matt. And uh, I've been traveling a lot recently as well. I've been at the ASI convention in Kansas City. And then from there to the teachers convention in Phoenix, where it was really, really hot. And the last few days, I've been in Florida doing some writing and preparing to continue on the itinerary. So, Matt, I'm always excited about the question and answer periods we have. So let's let's pray and ask the Lord to give us wisdom. All right. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus. And thank you for the opportunity to seek you for your wisdom. You've said, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that gives liberally to all men. Lord, we're asking you for wisdom from above. Thank you for the, those who participate in the program, who will ask questions and grant to me and Matt the ability to look at the questions and give me the ability to give answers directly founded on the principles of your word in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, uh, for anyone who is first time uh, viewer here, I just want to give you some instructions on how this works. Um, I will be monitoring the YouTube comments. So what you can do is just type your comment in into the comments there on YouTube. I will go through them as fast as I can while trying to keep track of everything here on the show. And I will ask Mark live. We are in fact live at this moment. So I'm going to take these questions and uh, ask uh, Pastor Mark what you have for him. And uh, we'll just go as long as we can today. Probably what, about an hour or so, Mark? Sure, sure. All right. All right, uh, Pastor Mark, just uh, I have a question here just to kind of get us started since I haven't had a chance to look at the comments yet. So the question is, can you explain the Adventist government to us? Um, you know, if there's some problem in a church, for example, uh, maybe a pastor that's doing something or maybe um, some outside source, some problem happening there. What are the different, you know, we've got conferences, we've got unions, we've got the general conference. How does everybody play uh, what are their roles in 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 a, a problem, and how and how they solve it? Matt, that's a very practical and a very good question. Um, in the Seventh Adventist Church, we have a constituent basis for our governmental structure. It's really based on Scripture, where Moses had a decentralized approach to solving problems. Remember, it was the thousands, the hundreds, the twelves, etc. And so in the Seventh Avenue Church, there are four basic levels of church administration and church governance. First, you have your local church. The local church is governed by a local church board. Problems within the local church are to be handled by that church board. Then each church, local church, is a part of a larger structure called the conference. Um, in our church structure, the physical facility of the local church is owned by the conference, not the members of the church. I'm talking about the physical plant, the building. Why? Because let's suppose that you had a renegade, rebellious uh, pastor or congregation that wanted to take that whole church out of the orbit of Seventh-day Adventist teachings and theology. Um, then the conference owns the building so they couldn't take the building with them. Um, the local conference is responsible for churches within that state conference. So many of our conferences are lined up according to states. There are some that you have conferences that uh, are more in more than one state. But typically, you have what we would call the state conferences. Um, but again, you have conferences that may overlap into other states. The responsibility of the conference is to minister to, support, encourage local, local churches. The tithe from the local church goes on to the conference. The conference then uses that tithe to pay the pastors. Now, what if you have a problem in a local conference? How can that be dealt with? in two ways. First, the constituency of that conference meets 
approximately every four years. And so the each church can choose delegates based on a proportional representative way form of government that go to a constituency meeting. One way of making a change in a conference is voting new leadership in. And that is done in, in constituency meetings. That happens. But let's suppose that doesn't happen. Let's suppose you're between sessions and there's a problem that's very egregious in a conference. The next level of organization is the union. The union of churches deals with a multi-state or multi-conference area. The responsibility of the union of churches is to guide, nurture, spiritually support, resource, help to develop major plans. And that happens in the conference level too. It's a strategic planning for evangelism, for outreach and so forth. But the union of churches consists of those conferences within that particular union. In some of the smaller overseas fields, we have what we call the union of churches, which uh, they may be too small to have a conference and they're directly attached to the union. But the union's responsibility when it comes to problem solving, Matt, is to work with the conferences to solve that particular problem. It could be personnel problems, could be theological problems, could be a a variety of problems. I don't want to give the impression that the, the function of unions and conferences is merely to solve problems or give direction. It is not that at all. It is to plan mission. The function of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to fulfill the mission of Christ, where Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Then the end shall come. Um, Where Jesus, through John and the angel in Revelation 14, verse 6 says, I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the earth. So the function of every administrative union what, unit, whether it's a local church, whether it is a conference, whether it is a union of churches, the function of those is to nurture members spiritually so they know Christ, so they can be ready for the coming of Christ, and so that they can proclaim the gospel and facilitate that. Then you have what's called the division. Now, the division does not have a constituency. The division is a division of the general conference. Some people think we have five layers of organization. We do not. They would say you have a conf- you have a general conference, you have a division, you have a union, you have a conference in a local church. No, the division does not have a constituency. The division is a division uh, or of the general conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Now, a lot of people would wish that the general conference could solve problems in a local church, but that's not how our governance structure is set up. The president of the general conference does not have the authority as some would think that he might to wave a magic wand and solve every local church problem. That church problem is dealt with by the local conference. Because if you don't have that kind of a structure, you can easily have abuse of authority. So we have a structure that is constituency based where conference leadership is elected by representatives from local churches, union leadership is elected by representatives from conferences, not all administrators and lay people from those conference areas. And union administration is elected by union, by conference uh, delegations. What about division of leadership? How is that elected? It's elected at a general conference session by the general conference constituency. So we are based, our whole structure is based on the idea of lay involvement, pastoral involvement, administrative involvement, working together to accomplish the ultimate mission of Christ to build up the people of God and to facilitate mission. Thank you, Pastor Mark, for that question. Now, uh, Pastor Mark, our next question, or uh, uh, Matt McDonald, I'm going to come back to your question. Uh, The next question comes in, Pastor Mark, uh, about uh, being perfect before being saved. So the question is, um, I've been told that you have to be perfect before being saved in your thoughts and your deeds. Uh, is that true? And how can I be saved? Uh, what a great question. The answer to that question is found in the Bible. It's found in Ephesians, the second chapter. 
And uh, I really appreciate the question because it indicates to me the heart of somebody who is seeking God. In Ephesians chapter 2, we begin there with verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. So salvation comes to us as we come to Christ, accept his sacrifice on our behalf. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for he who knew no sin became sin for us. Christ never sinned. He faced every temptation that Satan had. But on the cross of Calvary, he became sin for us. He took the guilt and shame of our sin. That's what it means in Colossians 3.13, where it says, Cursed is everyone that hangs upon the tree. He bore our curse. That's what it means in Hebrews 2, 8 and 9, where it says he tasted death for every man. So the truth of the matter is, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So how are we saved? By opening our hearts to Jesus, by saying, Jesus, I know I can't save myself. I know it's impossible for me in my own strength and power to be saved. But I do know that, Jesus, you died for me. I know that you paid the price, the ransom price for my sin on Calvary's cross, that in your life you overcame Satan's temptations and you revealed in your life the love of God for me. Because of your love for me, because of your death on the cross for me, Jesus, I give my life to you. When we make that decision, we are not perfect. We don't wait till we're perfect to come to Jesus. We come just as we are. That's what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 11, come unto me, all you that are burdened and heavy laden. We come just as we are. And when we come as we are, we come repenting of our sin and uh, confessing our sin. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. We come confessing. What is repentance? Repentance is sorrow for the things that we have done to break the heart of the God who loves us so much. So we come confessing and repenting. Jesus reaches out to us with a loving embrace and forgives us. We are saved by grace, but we are saved to good works. The grace of God that delivers us from the past guilt of sin begins to work in our lives to produce in our lives good works. So good works are the result of faith. Now, in the Bible, we talk about justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification takes place in an instant. I come to Christ confessing my sins. I come repenting, and I stand before God just as if I had never sinned. I stand perfectly in the righteousness of Christ. That's justification. Then, by faith, I receive Jesus' power into my life, and he begins the process of sanctification within me. What is sanctification? It is producing within my life the attributes of God. It is, the, it is allowing the Holy Spirit to produce the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace in my life. And what is glorification? One day when he comes, he will glorify me, and this mortal will be changed into immortality. Now, some people will say, well, wait a minute, we're going to have to live through the time of trouble. Do we live through it perfect? We live through the time of trouble totally, absolutely committed to Jesus. I love that old song, there's nothing between my soul and my Savior, not of this world's delusive dream. So when it comes to the end time, the Holy Spirit poured out into a life that is totally committed enables us to have victory and to be overcomers through the grace and the power of Jesus Christ. So do you have to be perfect to come to Jesus? Not at all. You come just as you are. He will accept you. He'll begin a work in you. He's the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, verse 2. Matt? All right, Pastor Mark, uh, thank you again for that answer. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. 
So I'm going to ask you to uh, go faster, but without sacrificing any of the. All right. <laughs> yeah, you, what, what you tell me, Matt, is to stop preaching. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, um, all right. A couple of quick ones here. What is your favorite Bible story? The one I'm reading at the time. Uh, so that's a quick answer. I love Daniel. I love Moses. I love the parables of Jesus. I love Matt. You know, it's such a hard question to answer because whatever I'm reading, the Bible is inspired by God. It changes your life when you read it. Next question, right. Matt. All right. Uh, somebody asked about subtitles in Portuguese. And um, I believe that our videos that are published do have subtitles in Portuguese. Uh, the videos that are live are not going to have the subtitles, but um, if you go to YouTube and you click the closed captioning button, you should be able to select Portuguese on, on most of our videos. All right. Yeah, um, Matt, I think, hey, Matt, I think we're doing like 12 languages now, aren't we? Yeah, it's at least 10. Um, yeah, it's at least 10. It might be 12, though. And I'm, okay. I believe Portuguese is one of them. I'm almost positive. All right. Um, next question is, um, how old will we be? When we get to heaven, I think this is talking about how, um, you know, there's a verse that talks about how the children will die at 100. And then obviously, if somebody yeah, sure. is 100 years old, they're going to get young again. So how old will we be what, well, when we get to heaven? Well, let, let me just read a couple of texts and then I'll explain them because I know that can be confusing. Um, Isaiah 65, 17, for behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. Um, then we go down. Verse 21 to 23, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree shall be the days of my people. So how old are we going to be? Like a tree. No, I got to continue. For as the days of a tree shall be the days of my people. Mine elect shall, um, lo shall long enjoy the work of their hands. And you go back to verse 20, it says there'll be no more infant from there to live a but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. That confuses some people. It's not a confusing passage. Look, it says there won't be more infant days. In other words, as Jesus said, we're not marrying, giving in marriage, having children in heaven. So we don't have children born in heaven. There are not births in heaven. But what it says is the child will die 100 years old. What is, what is that talking about? And then it says the sinner being 100 years old will be cursed. If you look at eternity, 100 years old is pretty, pretty young. We would think 100 years old is very old, right? So what that's really saying is that even at 100 years old, it'll be just like your childhood just like your childhood. You'll have that youth, that vigor, that vitality. So how old will we be? We will come to a perfect age and no longer age. We'll not have pain, suffering, heartache, sorrow. Uh, the Bible doesn't measure the time that we are going to live in eternity in years. It measures it in the quality of life. We will always have the abundance of youth, always be filled with joy and vitality and peace. So children will grow in heaven to that ripe age where they will no longer continue to, 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 to grow, but it'll be the quality of life that God gives us at that point. Childhood will be no more uh, after uh, that person continues to grow to, to some perfect age. Matt? Pastor Mark, I have another question here about heaven. And the question is, what will happen to families and marriages when we get to heaven? You know, that is often uh, a question that's, that's often asked. And it's largely based, Matt, on what Jesus said, that there would be no more marrying and giving in marriage. This is what we know. And, you know, in Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong unto us and to his children. Um, so uh, 1 Corinthians 13 says we see through a glass darkly. So we do not have every answer to that. But what we do know is this, that when God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he created them as a couple to live forever. 
We also know that in Micah 4, 8, it says the first dominion will be returned. So if God is going to recreate heavens and earth, and if it's going to be like the Edenic life, and if, as in Isaiah 65 says, they, they will build houses and inhabit them, it, and, and it talks about our children. Um, it talks, for example, that our children will be with us in Isaiah. So indeed, it would seem to me, and again, I would not pretend to know everything about it, and I can't answer the questions, what if a husband dies and uh, the wife remarries and they're both Christians, who's she going to be with, you know, and so forth. I let God figure all those things out. But from what I know from Scripture, if indeed the first dominion is going to return, it's going to be like the Eden life. And if indeed um, we're going to build houses and inhabit them, obviously we're not going to live by ourselves in those houses. We certainly would be part of the larger family in heaven. But I also believe that a Christian and husband and wife in uh, on earth, when they go to heaven, if indeed we're going to have our same general characteristics but be restored to what we would have been in Eden, I'm not going to walk by my wife and say, is that you, honey, over there? Hello, hello. Not, not at all. I think we will live in a sacred estate of matrimony in heaven uh, for Christian husbands and wives. Now, what about if a husband is lost and a wife is saved? God's love is so great that he's going to fill all of our hearts with love. But I think God's intent is to preserve the family, not only on earth, but in heaven. All right. Thanks, Pastor Mark. Now, I have two questions about baptism. The first one is, um, do we have to get baptized in order to be saved uh, or born again, the language they use? Do we have to be baptized in order to be born again? And the second question is, if we're getting rebaptized, does it have to be public or can it be in private? Okay, first, do we have to be baptized in order to be born again? When you are born again, you desire to be baptized. Um, remember when Jesus talked to Nicodemus in John 3, he said to Nicodemus, unless a man is born of water and the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So being born of the spirit is being born again. It's being transformed by the grace of Christ. When I'm transformed by the grace of Christ, I long to be baptized. I want to testify of my new life in Jesus Christ. Uh, Mark 16, verse 16 says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes and is baptized. So baptism itself, there's nothing magic about the water. Baptism is the outer expression of the inner commitment of the heart. So when my heart is right with God, when I'm transformed by God's grace, I want to express that publicly. Now, there's a couple other things about baptism. When we're baptized and make a commitment to Jesus, remember when Jesus was baptized in Mark, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it says that when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down upon him. So when we're baptized, according to Acts chapter uh, 2, it says, repent you therefore and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when we're baptized, the gift of the Spirit is given to us, not that we haven't had anything in the Holy Spirit before, but it's given to us to live the new life that we've just professed. The other thing about baptism is when we're baptized, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, chapter 12, we become part of the family of God. We're baptized into the body of Christ. So why be baptized? Number one, it's your public testimony of commitment to Christ. Number two, you open your heart to receive the strength to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit is given to you. He reveals to you gifts for service. Number three, you have the sense you're part of the family of God. And in that context of that family, you are nurtured and strengthened. Now, what about rebaptism? Does it have to be public? There are people who at times have sinned, and um, it's been quite egregious. Very few people know about it. They choose to be rebaptized as a recommitment of their faith, um, and it's not done publicly. Now, most of the time, I personally encourage people under general circumstances to be rebaptized publicly. If you have a Baptist Christian coming into the Adventist church, you have a Pentecostal Christian, they're 
we encourage rebaptism because it's really faith strengthening. But there have been a couple of times in my ministry where there have been people who I rebaptized privately because of the fact that um, there was something that had to be dealt with in a private way. So um, I encourage public rebaptism, but it's not mandated in every situation. Matt? All right, Pastor Mark, thank you for that. The next question is about uh, prophecy or a prophet. Um, why don't we have a prophet in the church anymore? Okay, um, that's a very good question, Matt. And um, I almost smile and say, if we were living up to the gift of prophecy that God has given us, um, he's given us plenty to think about. But here's the answer to that question. There's a difference between visions and dreams that an individual receives and the gift of prophecy to guide his church. When in 1844, this church went through the disappointment and discovered the truth about the heavenly sanctuary, and God shortly thereafter that gave to a young woman, Ellen White, at 17 years old, prophetic visions. He did that specifically to guide and direct a movement. Ellen White was raised up in her teens to give direction to the Advent people, direction in the area of establishing a school system that would be a godly Christian school system based on the word of God, to establish a health care system that's gone around the world, to give counsel to the people of God to prepare them for the coming of Christ, to help guide this movement in organizational structure. So the gift of prophecy was given at the embryonic formative stages of the Adventist church to take this church and prepare it for the coming of Jesus. Now, will at times God give us vision, give people visions and dreams today? As I've traveled in the mission field, and I've seen that experience where God has at times given people visions and dreams today. But is that the same as the prophetic gift that God gave based on Bible prophecy connected with the rise of the remnant church? It is not. For example, Revelation 12, 17 says the dragon, Satan, is wroth with the woman angry, went to make war with the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and of the testimony of Jesus. So notice the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus are linked. Another word for testimony is a witness from Jesus. In Revelation 19, 10, it says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In Lamentations 2, verse 8 and 9, it talks about this fact. It says that in Lamentations it says, the law is no more, therefore her prophets find no vision from the Lord. So, um, and you remember Proverbs says, where there is no vision, that is prophetic vision, the people perish. So there's a connection between a body of believers raised up by God to keep the law of God and in Christ have go out and proclaim his everlasting message to the world of obedience. To that church, God then raised up the gift of prophecy. So Ellen White's function must be, by its very nature, in the raising up of the Adventist church, different than merely a single gift of visions and dreams. Um, in fact, in Ephesians 4, it tells us that the gift of prophecy was given. And let me just read that uh, as kind of the to tie this, this together. Um, Ephesians chapter 4 says this, uh, it talks about uh, verse 8, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. So prophets, as well as these other gifts of the spirit, uh, uh, equip believers uh, for their work of ministry. Then it says, till all, we all come into the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to the measure, the stature, the fullness in Christ, that we should be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, speaking the truth in love. So the function of the gift of prophecy given to this church when it was being raised up 
was to keep this church from being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine and to keep it solid, faithfully based on the Bible. The gift of prophecy through the meetings ministry of Ellen White is not to take the place of the Bible, but it's to provide, it's to direct us back to scripture. As Ellen White says, of course, in that classic statement, her writings are the lesser light to lead to the greater light of, of the word of God. But Ellen White performed a unique function for this church that cannot be duplicated. But will God give visions and dreams in the future? I think he will, and that's certainly up to his discretion. All right, uh, great question and, and good answer, Pastor Mark. All right, uh, Pastor Mark, we, recently we did a video on LGBT, uh, LGBTQ+, and uh, there was a lot of extra questions that came in. Uh, one of the other questions we, we keep seeing up, actually even someone uh, read, I'm sorry, someone wrote an article about this questioning uh, what you said. Another question is, um, are LGBTQ plus targeting children and what evidence do you have that they are? Because the, the article that came out said that you were lying about that evidence that you showed. But is that is that true? Is their article really uh, true that you were lying or do you have some some hard evidence for that that idea? Well, first, Matt, uh, I respect all people's views and uh, I, whether the author of the article, um, um, I respect people when they write things. So people need to have the freedom to write. But frankly, uh, that was an accusation that is blatantly false. Um, let me give you the evidence of it and I will let you decide. Um, here is the American Family Association. The American Family Association in the United States monitors activities that take place in the part of the family, and they look at trends that take place um, in family relations. They're particularly concerned about the children of America. The president of the American Family Association simply said this, the LGBTQ plus community is targeting our children and teenagers and the agenda is being promoted in mainstream culture. Now, I did not say that, but the American Family Association president did. Um, let's just think about this for a moment. When you look at the fact that there are cartoons that have LGBTQ characters in them, who are those cartoons targeting? Are they targeting 80 years old, 70 years old? You and I well know they're not. When Kellogg's cereal comes out with a cereal called Together with Pride, a cereal for kids, who, who's targeting that? When Legos comes out with um, a set of characters, some LGBT killed, everybody is awesome. Who, who are they targeting? So when you have movies designed for kids, when you have cartoons designed for kids, when you have books that are being placed in the classrooms of our children, now, there is a um, organization that's called the um, Ethics and Public Policy Center. The Ethics and Public Policy Center. And um, it looks at public policy in, from a Judeo-Christian standpoint in the United States. And uh, Nathaniel Blake is a postdoctoral student. What that means is he has a doctorate degree, but he's postdoctoral. He wrote an article called, Why is the LGBTQ plus movement focusing on kids? And I'm just going to read you the last paragraph in that article. It's a fascinating article, but here's what he says. LGBTQ plus activists used to insist that they were not interested in recruiting children. And many adults who identify as LGBTQ plus still feel that way. But those driving the LGBTQ plus movement are now not even trying to hide their grooming. They are really coming for your children. So Matt, this is not something that I have made up. If you just look at what's going on in American culture, in American culture today, through mass media, through social media, through cartoons, through books targeting our kids, through Pride Month and cereals and through clothing, we find that this 
is even by the admission of those in the LGBTQ community. And if you look at places like the American Family Association, places like um, the LGBTQ, um, rather the uh, Ethics and Public Policy Center, if you look at those, it's very, very clear what this strategy is. Now, should we as Christians respect all people? We should. Should we as Christians reach out in loving kindness to all people? We should, whatever their orientation. But the church has responsibility to, to, to present biblical values. The role of the church is not to accommodate culture, but it's to transform culture. The role of the church is not to be shaped by culture, but it's to shape culture. The role of the church is to be a light in the world of darkness that we live, to stand for biblical values at whatever cost. And I believe we need people of courage today to stand up lovingly, kindly, respectfully, and say, this is what the Bible teaches. We're going to stand on the word of God and not compromise it. Thanks for the question, though, man. I'm glad I could clarify that. Yeah, and you know what? I want to uh, I want to share something real quick here. Let me share my screen. Uh, let's see. Let me just throw this over here real quick. So, all right, Pastor Mark, can you see that over there? Uh, not much, but tell me what it is, and I'll. Uh, yeah, all right. Yeah. Well, I just wanted yeah. to show a couple. Of, you know, you can do a quick search for this. You know, Disney, arguably the uh, most popular children's programming, uh, you know, here they are, uh, leaked videos showing the officials pushing LGBT agenda. Here's another article about how Disney executives vow that they're going to have more gay characters. Here's another article about how Disney executive producers admit to a gay agenda and adding queerness wherever they kid. So, you know, you can find articles everywhere about this. Um, I'm not sure how anybody could not say it. It's pretty clear on my end. All right, uh, Pastor Mark, let's see here. Next question is, um, can you share with us any examples of winds of doctrine coming into our movement? Sure. You're quoting from Ephesians 6. While I'm looking at this text, Matt, I always like to hear where people are um, listening from. So if you're listening, just uh, put in the chat where you're listening from, and um, that will be uh, an encouragement to us. We like to see that from around, around the world. Um, that's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. We should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. What kind of winds of doctrine can be blowing today? Um, let me give you four or five examples. I think one of the winds of doctrine that is blowing uh, could be a, an attempt to reinterpret Genesis, where God says he created the world in six days, rested the seventh day. There are those, even among us, some of us, that want to make these long periods of time that the earth has been going on for millions of years. Um, that would be, at least in my view, a wind of doctrine. There are those that want to uh, change our prophetic interpretation, saying, you know, this issue of the mark of the beast, the national Sunday law, that uh, certainly was part of a 19th century mentality, but that's not going to happen. That'd be another wind of doctrine that's blowing. I think you can look at the ultra right and the ultra left. Uh, on the ultra right, you're going to have people that are criticizing and the, the general conference criticizing its leadership and, and, uh, and causing people to lack confidence in the very organization that God has set up um, and to, to, to provide a biblical foundation for this movement. And I think you can look on the ultra right and see this sharply critical view. I think that's a wind of doctrine that blows through. I think this whole idea of human sexuality, what we've been talking about, LGBTQ, I think that's another wind of doctrine that blows through the church. Um, there is a wind of doctrine that's blowing through on anti-Trinitarianism. And, and I think that's a wind of doctrine that blows through the church, a misunderstanding of early Adventist history. Um, the idea that Christ 
uh, came forth from the Father, uh, rather than Christ being an eternal being. John 8, verse 58 says, Jesus, I am the I am. He's, he's eternal. So I think that's another wind of doctrine blowing through the church. I think another wind of doctrine is trying to um, um, reinterpret scripture and to look at scripture from the standpoint of merely cultural or what they would call the historical critical method. In other words, you look at it there. So are there winds of doctrine blowing in the church? There are, but here's the incredible good news. Faith in Christ leads us to obedience to the word of God. It is the Bible. This is not Bibleolatry. What would you know about Jesus if you didn't have the word of God. You know, there are some people that say, well, look, uh, all we need is Jesus today. Which Jesus? Is it the Jesus of your own thinking, the Jesus of your own mind? It is true that we need Jesus, but it's true we need the real Jesus. Where would we be with the second coming of Christ if we left out Jesus? Where would we be with the state of the dead if we left out Jesus? Where will we be this with the sanctuary if we left out Jesus? Where will we be with the Sabbath if we left out Jesus? You see, Jesus is at the center of every single doctrinal truth. Therefore, any approach that says, oh, we need Jesus, but doctrines are unimportant, is a misunderstanding of the real Jesus of Scripture. So, Matt, those are a few things, but here's the good news. There are scores of Adventists and Adventist pastors and Adventist administrators that are seeking God, that are, that are hanging on to the word of God, that are filled with the grace of Christ, that want the love of Jesus to fill their life, to touch others around them, that are living God-centered Christian lives. And, and I just praise God for them. You know, I have great confidence that God is going to take this church, the Seventh Adventist Church, through the end. I do not believe, based on the Bible or the writings of Ellen White, that every wind of doctrine is going to come through and destroy the church. I don't believe that in one minute. It's not going to be some tornado of false doctrine that comes through, destroys the church, and God has to bring up forth another movement. Not at all. According to Ephesians 5, this church will rise as fair, eh, eh, without any spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's what Jesus wants to do with his church. As I said to a group recently, Christ is the husband, the church is the bride, and Jesus is going to get his bride to the wedding. Thank you, Pastor Mark. All right, let me see if I can go through some of these different locations here. We have a lot of people uh, from all over the world. We have uh, Liberia, Norway, Jamaica, Brooklyn, New York, Bahamas, Panama, North Carolina, Kentucky, Fiji, New Mexico, Ohio, Georgia, Florida, uh, let's see here. North Carolina. Let's see. I think I said North Carolina. Um, another person from Jamaica. We have Guyana and New Brunswick, Canada and Long Island, New York. Well, they're keeping on coming in. And so send them in to us. And we enjoy looking at them, knowing that this ministry has a worldwide influence. And we know that for some people uh, in Africa, in some of the hemispheres, it's in the middle of the night. And they'll pick up the recording of this the next morning. Matt, let's spend another five, 10 minutes and uh, then bring our question and answer period to the close. All right. Um, the next question is, are we to pray for the latter rain? Um, we do have counsel in that area. The, 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 the answer to that question, Matt, is in Zechariah, the uh, 10th chapter, and to the first verse. Um, here's what scripture says. And so Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1, ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, uh, grass in the field for everyone. So, so you have this discussion of the latter rain. Um, in the economy of Israel, the early rain germinated the crop, the latter rain completed the harvest. So in scripture, just before the coming of Jesus, there will be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is unprecedented, that will enable God's people to finish his work on earth. We cannot do it in our strength. It's only in the strength of the Lord that we can accomplish this goal. And so should we pray for the latter rain? The Bible says we should ask the Lord for rain. Now, the Holy Spirit is not poured out on the church corporately until it's poured out on my heart individually. 
So this is not just some mass outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, in, in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, it says that if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, then how much more shall your heavenly Father give good gifts to those that ask? And so Luke chapter 11, I think it's verse 13. I just want to check to be 100% sure. So I'm giving, yeah, it is. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit comes on me individually. And as it comes on me individually and others are praying for the Holy Spirit and they receive it individually, then it comes on the church totally. But God doesn't just rain his spirit down on a corporate group, some of whom have little interest in the reception of the spirit and a little interest in witnessing. God gives the Holy Spirit for two reasons. One, to in, in the latter rain, one, to intensify positive Christian values in our life. So that two, and, and as part of that, to strengthen us for the time of trouble. And three, uh, secondly, rather, to enable us to be witnesses for Christ in the final generation to proclaim his love. Why would God pour out his Holy Spirit in full abundant power if we are to enable us to witness, if we are not currently witnessing or sharing our faith at all. So pray for the latter rain, pray for the Holy Spirit, pray that God will enable your heart to be receptive to the Holy Spirit, surrender anything you know in your life that's not in harmony with his will to him, and commit your life to being a powerful witness for him in the final generation. Zechariah 10, 1 your text, ask you, of the Lord reign in the time of the latter rain. Matt? All right, Pastor Mark. The uh, next question, I actually skipped over this in the beginning, uh, comes from Matthew McDonald. The question is, um, for many years, the Seventh-day Adventist church has been struggling with women being ordained as leaders and pastors. Is it wrong for a woman to be ordained as a leader of the Seventh-day Adventist church? That's a good question, and um, let me answer in a in a couple ways. We need to look at the a, a broadness of the answer. One, we do have Seventh Day Adventist women who are leaders in a number of places. They're using their gifts and skills. For example, uh, we have a female who is one of the vice presidents of the General Conference of Seventh Day Adventists. We also have a female who's the treasurer of the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists. So the Seventh-day Adventists have often recognized the, the gifts that women bring to the church. They've appreciated those gifts and foster those gifts. Now, when it comes to women's ordination, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists uh, in session has voted um, on three separate occasions on this instance. And uh, in those votes, they have chosen not to move ahead with women's ordination into the pastoral ministry. Um, we have not taken that vote, um, in fact, on women being elders in local churches. In fact, um, uh, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists uh, has, um, has opened that door. So whatever you and I think about that subject, whatever you and I think about it, I think there are three things. One, the question of women's ordination to the pastoral ministry is an issue that the general conference in session has voted upon, and therefore, as part of the world body of churches, to promote the unity of the church as a cohesive body, we accept that vote. That's one. Two, that we do have women in leadership, we can encourage females in leadership positions as their gifts and talents enable them to fill the unique position which they are prepared for. And three, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists has not voted that uh, women cannot serve as local elders in local churches. That's up to the local church. Frankly, there are some churches that accept that, some churches that do not. It's not worth splitting the church over. So um, our focus then is that every member of the church use their gifts, their talents to foster the mission of the church. Matt? All right, Pastor Mark. The next question is um, 
are we going to be able to fly to other worlds? Um, and I, after that, it says with gold, with wings of gold. So I'm not sure what the wings of gold part is, but are we going to be able to fly? This is talking about when we get to heaven. Are we going to be able to fly to other worlds with wings of gold? I don't know about wings of gold. I've not heard that one, Matt, but the closest I can come, you know, you know, Matt, me well enough to know. I always try to look for a Bible text to answer your yeah. question. How about wings? Are we going to have wings? Well, the Lord's going to show us that, isn't he? We're going to fly some way, Matt. I'm not 100% sure how. We, we may have wings, sure. But, uh, but um, you know, I think there's I, a know. quote of Ellen White actually talking about yeah. little children flying with wings. Oh, with their wings, sure. Yeah. I, I'm familiar with that. But, you know, um, uh, here, here is the, the text that kind of guides me in all this. It's uh, Revelation 14, you know, verses 1 to 5. It's talking about the um, 144,000. And uh, which is a number of to, to describe the redeemed. And it says they follow the lamb wherever he goes. Well, if we're going to follow Jesus wherever he goes, um, he's going to be traveling to the various planets. He is going to be traveling to unfallen worlds. Um, you know, the Bible teaches that other than this world, planet Earth, that um, there are other created worlds outside of our solar system that is never that have never fallen by sin. You find that in Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. It talks about Christ who created the worlds. You find it in the book of Job, chapter 1, where Satan and uh, comes before the throne of God and just to the gates of heaven, though, because he was cast out of heaven, but he can only come to the gates of heaven. He comes there to this council meeting and other representatives come from the varying worlds. Uh, you find it in Corinthians, I think it's 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9, where it says that this world is a spectacle unto the world. We are a spectacle unto the world, to angels and men. So the world's the larger context. So Jesus will, but I have to make it very clear that those other planets, none have fallen by sin. This is the only planet that's fallen by sin. Obviously, they must have had some opportunity or some chance. Uh, they've exercised their freedom of choice. They're loyal to God. But when it says we follow the Lamb wherever he goes, that indicates to me we're going to do a lot of travel. Travel from star to star, from planet to planet. There's a wonderful chapter, too, in the book Early Writings on this. And uh, so if you look at the earlier chapters and early writings, you'll find one on this very subject. So, yes, we will travel with Jesus. It's going to be wonderful to see vast technologies that have never sinned and civilizations and the brilliance of those civilizations. I'm excited about it. Well, Matt, let me take one more question. All right, Pastor Mark. The uh, Sorry, I wasn't ready for the next question here. Um, okay, here's another question about uh, health. So the question is, in regards to fasting, how many days should we fast and how long should we fast for? Well, how Which many sounds days? like the same question, but um, so I guess when we start fasting, like how often should we do it? And when we when we are fasting, how long should we continue for? Well, first, everybody's in health is different individually. So the first thing I would say is you have to know your own system and your own health. There may be health problems. I wouldn't want to give, for example, uh, some people who have acute health problems counsel that they need to fast for X number of days a week. Um, but if you are in a measure of good health, generally to fast one day a week is not going to hurt you at all. And one way to do that that's quite simple is, for example, in our home, we eat lunch typically from 1.30 to 2 o'clock every day. The simple way for us to fast for 24 hours is simply not to eat breakfast the next day and then eat lunch the next uh, at 1.30. So, for example, let's suppose it's Tuesday at 1.30 to 2 o'clock, I eat lunch. And then if I want to fast for one day, I just don't eat supper that night and don't eat breakfast the next day. We eat two meals a day anyway, but I don't meal, eat breakfast the next day. And uh, then I pick up my fast. That's a way that it could be done very, very nicely. Um, but what I want to do is talk to you a little bit for a minute or two here about fasting. What is the purpose for fasting? The purpose for fasting is not to achieve superior holiness. You remember it was the Pharisee that said, I fast twice a week and give tithes of all that I possess. I'm not like this other person, the publican, the, 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 uh, yeah, the publican. So 
fasting does have, I would think, some basic benefits. One, it has a health benefit to give our stomachs and our bodies some time to recover, rest, repair, etc. So that that's a value of fasting. I think there are health benefits to it. Um, I think secondly, the purpose of fasting is so that I can spend more time with Jesus, so that I can spend some time in prayer where I would be eating during that hour, preparing food for that. I can spend some time studying the word of God. Thirdly, there are times that we are so burdened about something in our life that we can't, we, we just don't feel like eating. There is, have you ever had a time in your life where there's something really burdening you? You fast to bring that burden to Jesus. You fast to give him that thing that is consuming you. So how often should you fast? I can't answer that question for you. For many healthy people, um, fasting one day a week by skipping a meal is very helpful. Um, but um, that's a choice that each individual has to make. But I can say to you, if you fast, it's not for superior holiness. What it is, it is to know God better, to lay your burdens at his feet, and to give your body a little cleansing. Matt, this has been a good question and answer period. We've gone almost an hour. Yeah, I always appreciate uh, getting a chance to throw some hard balls, a few curve balls your way. <laughs> and uh, as usual, uh, thank you for, for giving us some, uh, some great answers to those questions. Uh, friends, uh, if you're not subscribed to our channel, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out the next time we do something like this or other videos that we put out. Uh, and also, let me get to the close to the camera here. Um, if I missed your question, I am sorry. I, um, you know, maybe I forgot it. I may have accidentally skipped over it. Uh, sometimes I don't answer or ask Pastor Mark the questions if we have other videos that answer those questions. There was one that came in about the 24 elders. We have another video specifically for that. Uh, go on our channel, just search 24 elders. Um, you know, if you didn't have your answer, maybe do that as well. If it's something really important, uh, let me put our email address up here. You can uh, you can email us if you have something you really should try to answer. Um, at hopelives365.com. I still have a bunch of the other questions. Next time we do this show, I'll try to and ask them. Um, but thank you for tuning in from around the world. And uh, thank you for asking these questions, these important questions to Pastor Mark. I look forward to uh, seeing you again next time, Pastor Mark, on this show and for our future videos. Thanks, Matt. Look forward to seeing you next time. We appreciate each of you. We appreciate our viewership. Thank you for joining us, and I hope this has been helpful. Let me offer a short prayer, Matt, before we go. Father, thank you with all of our hearts for the Word of God. Thank you for the opportunity to face hard questions and to answer them from your Word. Now, fill our hearts with your love and your grace. Keep us faithful to your Word always. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.